Oh hi, I'm the heretic. Last time we left Dr. Richard Wolf, he was busy condescending to us how we're just scared. Frightened children who don't like that the economic system is transitioning to socialism. Where do I begin? How about right where we left off? I understand it. That's a human, you want to hold on because changing systems is frankly scary, always has been. You're just being a dismissive, condescending prick. Ugh, please continue. So this is a way you can hold on to a kind of loyalty to capitalism in general while joining in the critique of the way capitalism is here. The answer I would give, which will make these folks unhappy, is, look, capitalism is what you got. Based on what? Your Marxist straw man definition of capitalism? Just because Marxism is a world-conquering totalitarian ideology that cosplays as an economic system doesn't mean all economic systems are that way. It's called projection and it's intellectual dishonesty. We didn't become dependent on the defense industries because a lot of people are crooks or because a lot of people have cronies whom they favor. Come on, that's not really a very profound analysis. You're right. It's a pretty bad one. I mean, what brain-dead idiot would think that these things just happened? And if you don't like the way it's evolved, that's very nice. But imagining that you can go back to something pure that won't then repeat the same evolution to what we have you know, kind of begs the question, how come? If you don't like the way it's evolved, the way it's evolved... You never disappoint, Richie. You see, according to Dr. Richie Rich, the military-industrial complex is just the natural, inevitable result of late-stage capitalism. It just happens. and has absolutely nothing to do with agency or the incentives created by the representative democratic denomination of the Church of Statism. Is it a back-and-forth where businesses like Lockheed Martin donate to the campaigns of foundations of politicians who then, in turn, write favorable legislation for their donators, feeding into a vicious cycle of kickbacks and quid pro quos that picks our pockets and breaks our legs? According to the good doctor, nah, everything just happens because capitalism. I know learning things like incentives and rational decision making is hard, but if you can't figure it out now after you've been a college professor for god knows how long, then I can only conclude that you're just too stupid. When capitalism emerges in Europe out of feudalism, Okay, so you don't think capitalism merged out of slavery. Good to know. If you're gonna be a dithering idiot, at least be a consistent dithering idiot. It isn't hard. There are lots of places where it is started, where it grows for a while, and then it blows up. It dies. Or it goes in directions that are horrible and people reject it. And that's not surprising because you don't one day decide to go from system A to system B, set up the new system B, and everything just works ducky fine. He's making an equivalency argument. You see, the atrocities and horrors of communism are okay because they're just experiments. Yeah, we'll get back on that later. By all means, Professor, please continue. In the last 300 years, the two examples of large societies that have grown the fastest are the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. And just to remind everyone, in 1917, when the Russian Revolution happens, Russia is the most backward country in Europe. The vast majority of its people are illiterate and work in agriculture. How much do you think it costs to produce a brand new, never before seen a piece of technology? Let's say Apple's first iPhone. You have to develop it. You have to iterate on the software, draw up packaging designs and then implement them, get the electronic parts manufactured and make sure that they all fit together, bug testing and beta testing the software, and all that is just the easy parts before we get into things like taxes, liability, regulatory compliance, marketing, and all sorts of other fun stuff. To get the first iPhone from concept into a customer's hands costs Apple millions of dollars. How much do you think it costs Apple to build a second iPhone? Eh, about $100, give or take. Now, how much do you think it costs for Samsung to reverse engineer Apple's hard work and innovation? The West showed Russia and China the way to industrialization. These, well, somewhat capitalistic economies created the conditions for the Industrial Revolution. They put the hard work in figuring out how it all fit together. So to credit socialism for rapid industrialization is, well, pretty disingenuous. It's like copying off a smart kid's test and congratulating yourself off your brilliance. I don't know how much Mr. Wolf knows about this, but either he's ignorant or deliberately dishonest. And given that he's been a professor for years and he's paid to be knowledgeable about these things, I will treat him accordingly. It is a poor country that has just lost World War I, and then had a revolution, then had a civil war. I mean, to expect this society to be anything other than an economic basket case would not be reasonable. 
Hong Kong went from a fishing village to a bustling metropolis in less than a century. Singapore is on an island with no natural resources to speak of and it's one of the wealthiest countries on earth. It's an old communist trick to suggest that circumstances dictate destiny. That's why they have such an obsession with class and why you see commies all the time saying they want to eat the rich as though no poor person ever became rich or rich person ever became poor. They don't want to make anyone wealthy because in their minds that's not possible. Thus, since they can't achieve equality by building people up, they have to drag people down. I don't say this for your sake, doctor, but for viewers who might otherwise be suckered in by your false credibility. They came up with the following idea, that the problem of capitalism is two fundamental things. One, that private individuals own the means of production. They own the land, they own the factories, they own the stores, the machinery. People owning the means of production is a problem, is it, doctor? A prostitute rents out her body, ergo a prostitute's body becomes her means of production. So if she didn't own her own means of production, that'd make her a sex slave. And that the people, the owners, are really a very small part of the population. 1%, 2%, 5%, maybe even 10%, although rarely did it get that high. But that means the vast majority of people are never part of the owners. This has no relevance to anything. Why bring it up? And the basic socialist idea was, if you allow a small number of people to control the means of producing all the goods and services we all need to survive, they're going to use that control to make the system work for them. And they're not going to worry about the rest of us. You just completely moved on to a different subject. You're talking about how the owners are 5% of the population just 20 seconds ago, and now you're talking about how they get the system whatever that means, to work for them? I know what you're trying to do. You throw out one statement that owners are 5% of the population and move on to something else while doing nothing to explain your first statement or back it up with facts. It's as though we're just supposed to accept it as true. Doctor, you are lying to us, and I, for one, will not stand for it. At this point, I have no need to continue, as I've already exposed him to be a liar and a charlatan, but for the sake of completeness, I'll continue what I started and press on. In other words, it's a recipe for a society that produces wealth for the top 5 to 10 percent, but not for everybody else. That gives power, political and other power, to the vo those at the top and not to everybody else. You just throw these assertions out without explaining anything. Why should anyone take anything you say as truth? So the socialist idea was this is fundamentally unjust, fundamentally undemocratic, this is what's wrong with capitalism, and how do you solve it? Are you going to explain how 5% of owners having influence in the status of clergy is unjust or undemocratic? Or are we just going to move on to the next talking point like a little bitch? You make collective ownership, not private. The society as a whole should own the means of production. Yep, moving on. Oh, no, you don't. Before I can even begin to entertain these ideas, I want to know the basis which you find the situation you described as undemocratic or unjust. Because otherwise, I'm going to treat it as you trying to manipulate me with meaningless words to provoke an emotional reaction. If you think that that would ever work on me, that you could provoke an emotional reaction out of me, you are absolutely correct. It's making me feel nothing but unrelenting rage at your persistent dishonesty. You liar! the factories, the offices, the stores, so that they are good for everybody, so that what they produce is distributed roughly equally, so that the influence and the decisions are made. So social, that's why it's called socialism, it's the society that should own. That's the theory anyway. Please continue. It focuses on the workplace. Its idea is the way you make sure that the government never again becomes an institution over the people, but rather simply an instrument of the people. It's this lofty, high-minded idealism for the church of statism that prevents people from recognizing the worship of government as the problem, or even recognizing that they're worshiping the government to begin with. If only we worship government in the right way, then it won't end in misery and poverty and tyranny. We promise.
That's never going to happen, especially when you empower the government with the ability to redistribute property. That government, with the power to take away property on a whim, has the ability to control access to said property. They've already redistributed all the prostitutes into sex slavery. What's to say they won't bar your access to health care for failing to toe the party line? How do you know they won't abuse this kind of power that you're so desperate to give to them? If you're so afraid of 5% of owners having influence in the government, what makes a socialist government any less immune to such corruption? Magical socialism unicorns? Is by making sure that at the base of society, where people live and work, the wealth, the productive capability is in their hands. It's not in their hands, though. It's in the collective's hands. Do I need to explain the tragedy of the commons? When you have a collective good, it's everybody's rational incentive to make use of that good as much as possible and as quickly as possible. If they don't, then someone else will. This is the fundamental problem with socialism and common ownership. Everyone wants the benefits of owning a business but has no reason to maintain it, aside from some high-minded idealism with no incentive to back it up. If you want the slogan of 21st century socialism, it's this, democratize the enterprise. You know you can do that under capitalism, right? Found a business and run it democratically. See how you do. I wish you all the success on the- Oh wait, you're a college professor. I doubt you've even met a business owner in your freaking life. If you really knew how to run a business, you'd be making millions in the marketplace. But the fact that you're a college professor is a confession of your business incompetence. That's all the evidence I need that we shouldn't let Dunning-Kruger jackasses have a say in how businesses are run. Maybe if you got kicked out of your ivory tower and had to get a real job, you'd have some empathy for the people who work their asses off taking 100 hour weeks for less than minimum wage just to keep their shops afloat. End this process where there's a handful of people who make the decision. In most American corporations, and corporations do the bulk of the business in modern capitalism, a tiny group of what are called major shareholders, the people who have big blocks of shares, they select who the board of directors is. Shareholders buy stock in the company. They're literally invested in the well-being of their company and their fortune depends on success, at least in part. Isn't this democracy? People who have a stake in the company making company decisions? I thought you'd be in support of that, especially since virtually all of these big corporations are publicly traded. Literally anyone could buy a piece of them. But no, that would mean you'd have to be consistent and you'd have to have principles. And you just don't do that, do you, doctor? One percent of Americans own three quarters of the shares. It's highly concentrated. A tiny number of people, the 1%, own the bulk of the shares. So who are those 1%? Uh, never mind. I know you're just going to move on without examining it further. I'm sure if you dug deep, you'd find a lot of mutual funds and investment firms where your grandmother's retirement savings are not only kept safe, but grown. But that would make finance look good and benevolent, wouldn't it? How do you run a corporation? Doctor, you are probably the last person I would ever ask that question to. There's an election every year to get on that board. And the way the election work is, if you own a share of stock in the company, you get one vote. If you have 10 shares, you get 10 votes. If you own a million shares, you get a million votes. If you have no shares, that's how many votes you get. So there's no pretense of democracy. If you ignore the whole elections thing, you know, the European Union does a similar thing, where our country's votes and the EU Parliament are weighted by population size. Besides, why would we want businesses to be run democratically? They probably aren't more productive or innovative than traditional businesses since otherwise it'd be a much more common business model. It's definitely not out of principle because collectivists have no principles. It couldn't be because he just wants political power and believes he can seize authority for himself under the pretense of democracy, could it? Tell me, doctor, what happens if society democratically chooses capitalism and privately owned businesses? What then? So, if a handful of people own the bulk of the shares, they control everything. They select the 15 or 20 people on the board of directors. The board of directors decides what the company produces, how the company does it, where the company is located, and what's done with the profits. Oh no, this is so terrible. Ew. Everybody helps produce the profits. The employees have to live with the decision, but have no influence on it. It is the opposite of democracy. And if you don't have democracy at the workplace, you can't ever have it real in politics either. You still haven't explained why democracy is worth the time of day. 
If workers took over a factory that had a worker co-op instead of a top-down, and the workers together decided what to do with the profits, you think they'd give a few executives $25 million so they have more money than they know what to do with, while everybody else has to borrow money to send their kids to college? It'll never happen. You don't know that. You still haven't explained why executives or owners demanding huge salaries is a bad thing. The premise of your argument is class envy, which is extremely manipulative and has no basis in fact or logic. The executives and owners being rich does not make you poor. That's not how money works. Doctor, you clearly have no idea how a business works if your understanding of the employer-employee relationship is so ridiculous. Wouldn't a workers' cooperative also be incentivized to buy out the state to improve their profits? Because improved profits means increasing their salaries? You think a collection of workers, say 400 in a factory, considering that you could make more money if you moved the production to China, are they going to vote to get rid of their own jobs? It's not going to happen. Of course not. Whatever undemocracy you think is occurring in businesses that goes against the principles you pretend to have, at least business owners, directors, and shareholders aren't manipulating people with class envy into using force and violence of the state to steal from people. You couldn't settle for just being a liar, could you? You also have to be a sociopath. And I wanted you to also just counter another argument that I hear constantly. I earned it. You know, we earned this money. Yes, doctor. Professor. Please, tell people who work their asses off and put their and their families' futures and reputations on the line and manage to receive a reward for their hard work and risk-taking should be disregarded because of how it just makes you sad. Here's a fun topic, exploitation. So, doctor, tell us, how is two voluntarily consenting adults in an exchange of labor for money a bad thing? So the only way I'm gonna hire you for $20 an hour is if you produce more in the hour than I give you. I would hope so, because otherwise you're of no worth to an employer. This is how exchange works under capitalism. The employer values the labor more than the money, and the employee values the money more than their own labor. Still hasn't explained why this is a bad thing, but judging by the caliber of arguments, er, excuse me, lies that we have heard so far, can't say I'm anxious to hear them. So when you feel in a vague way at the end of the day... Ugh. Oh god, what the hell? She is way too excited about being metaphorically exploited. As you walk home that you're being ripped off, you're absolutely right. Or in Marx's language, exploited. Exploitation is a meaningless subjective term that is meant to provoke an emotional reaction. I earned it. No, you didn't. He just ripped people off. You're not going to explain anything because you're a liar and a charlatan. So I will. The theory is known as surplus value. It argues that, as explained earlier, the money that is not being paid to the employee is added to the value of the company. Say you are paid $20 an hour to produce $30 an hour in stuff. That extra $10 is surplus value. However, surplus value does not exist. This is how you know Marxists know nothing about businesses because Business 101 says that company revenue comes from customers, not the labor of the workers. They can work for as little as they want and produce as many widgets as they want, but if nobody's buying, then the company can't stay afloat no matter how hard they quote unquote exploit their workers. What did they do exactly to earn that money? sell things that people wanted to buy. What have you done to add value to anything except my YouTube channel? Nothing. Those people are going to tell me they earned? Earned what? Did they ever set foot in the factory? No. Do they have any idea what this company does? No, they don't care. You're describing yourself to a T. But go on. Tell us all about the rich people because you can see into their souls. Let's now do a little logic. If there are people like shareholders who get a lot of goods and services they didn't help produce, then there must be elsewhere in that system people who produce what they do not get. That's an absolute non sequitur based on broken premises. Famous socialist Rosa Luxemburg once said that it's either socialism or barbarism. Here we are a hundred years later. In what ways have you seen that play out today? The 62 richest people in the world, most of whom are Americans, not all American, but most of whom are U.S. citizens, the 62 richest people together have more wealth than the bottom half of the population of this planet.
That's barbarism to you? That some people are richer than others? There's something terribly wrong with your moral compass if that's the case. If you look at all the statistics of the World Health Organizations, the bottom half of our population are people who die way earlier than they need to. Why? Because their diets are no good, or they don't have enough food in the first place, or they can't get to a clinic to have little problems that are easily solved. This assumes that their poverty is a direct result of others having money. That one person having a huge slice of the cake means that others must be without. This is known as Malthusian economics, which has been thoroughly debunked by the mere existence of technological innovation creating value out of thin air. Now I see where Marxists are coming from. These images are heartbreaking, and it's easy to imagine how if they were simply given money, they'd be way better off. The problem is that this actually wouldn't help them. Just ask how effective foreign aid is in Africa. To say nothing of the rabid inefficiency and immorality of using a violent coercive monopoly because the good doctor is so charitable with other people's money. Now there's no moral or ethical justification for this situation. I would answer this if I thought for a moment that he cared about morals or ethics. That the way capitalism has evolved has compromised the ecology and environment of this planet, literally threatening us with 27 diseases and 57 losses of fundamental resources. This is crazy to permit this to go on. Ugh, are we really doing this? The state is the biggest polluter on planet Earth. Just look at how well the ecology thrived under the Soviet Union. Oh, wait. Is this notion that the, the Western world, the world that has the wealth and the military might, is in a war, an endless war, against something as vague as terrorism, whatever exactly, that is. Remember what I said earlier about Marxists seeing the church of statism and the marketplace as one and the same? This is what I was talking about. So the government and its elected politicians use tax dollars to send soldiers to fight a war against a concept and somehow this is the result of voluntary exchange and respect for private property? Ugh. I don't know how much more I can take. You know what? I'm just gonna call it here. This video is mostly over anyways. This ideology is based on a lie argues disingenuously and operates on rabid inconsistencies promoted by either useful idiots or deranged sociopaths who are so conceited they think they have it perfect. They know better than Lenin or Stalin or Pol Pot how to get to utopia and they are perfectly willing to gamble with the lives of hundreds of millions more. Marxism is an evil ideology and must be opposed and defeated wherever it is found. But to be fair, I see the appeal of Marxism. But follow me on this one. If you were raised in government schools built on the Prussian model designed to make students into unthinking drones, obedient to authority figures, and you aren't taught to think critically, you definitely aren't taught to think logically. History, and the history of communism in particular, is just a sterile listing of names and dates and the only way you know it to be correct is because the teacher said so. Now imagine this victim of a cruel and inhumane educational system goes to a university. Their professor then speaks of Marxism in these glowing and glorious terms. Now the only way he knows he's correct is because he's a professor and therefore he must be obeyed. But even more than that, he sounds intelligent on the subject and it's a cohesive sounding worldview that appeals to their emotions and desire for a sense of belonging and doing good. What's wrong? Don't you want to help people who are being exploited? All the problems of the world would just go away if we abolished private property and made everything fair. As this person has no personal stake in capitalism, owning very little if any private property for themselves, this all sounds wonderful. Which makes what you're doing all the more reprehensible, eh, doctor? Taking kids lobotomized by government schools and filling their obedient minds with propaganda and lies. Lies that can't just be wrong, they have to be murderous. Karl Marx can be forgiven as the theory was quite new at the time. He didn't know what the result would be, and let's be honest, he wasn't that smart. Nowadays, however, Red China, the Soviet Union, Cambodia, Cuba, North Korea, Venezuela, it's no longer a theory. We have seen Marxism in practice and it is brutal, absolutely horrifying. Don't spoon food me this bullcrap about all this empathy you claim to have for the workers, doctor, when what you're professing from your position of authority as a university professor is built on a mountain of hundreds of millions of broken bodies. Where's your empathy for them? Were they not being exploited? What of the horrors of Soviet domination of Eastern Europe during the Cold War? 
Dr. Wolf, you are a liar and a charlatan, and I cannot wait for the day where your ilk are exposed for the lying sats of putrid filth that you are. You think it's great that 40-something percent of people under 30 have a favorable view of socialism? I'm sure you're also aware that a lot of that poll has to do with how young people are realizing that they've been lied to their entire lives. How do you think they'll react when they figure out the ones who have been lying to them this whole time is you, doctor? Questions? Comments? Critique? What do you think of Dr. Wolfie here? Anything we'd like to add? Leave a comment below. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today. Excuse me, I need to rest my voice. This is freaking painful.